Lord and Christ. Now Peter is explaining through the word that they crucified Jesus Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked, they were convicted. Something something got a hold of them on the inside. They were smoked in their heart. I like that cuz you know what that tells me? You ever been punched in the chest? Remember how that felt, Brother Teeman? That's how conviction should feel. Amen. Like somebody balling up their fist, and part of our problem is, is we're not convicted enough in our hearts anymore. But Lord, I want something to just uh, hit me right here, and it's like a, just like somebody's just hit me, and it's like, oh, there's a pain there. There's, oh Lord, I got to do something. I got to be changed. I, I can't live this way anymore. Is that how you felt? You knew what you were. You knew you were a liar and a cheat and all the things that we used to do. You know, we knew what we were when we came to the place of repentance. But something hit us right here and you said, Oh God, forgive me. And you boohooed and you cried and you wept and you didn't care who saw you. Huh? You didn't care if people made fun of you. You knew something was happening right here and I needed to get this right. This wasn't right. So then they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They wanted to know. They knew that they had sinned. And they wanted to know how they could get rid of the guilt of sin off of them. Because sometimes when we know we've done wrong, there's guilt. And it's not just because somebody else said we're guilty. It's something that we carry with us all of our life. And, and they hold, it holds us down and it binds us. And we know we've done wrong. And so we carry that guilt on the inside of us. And, and you know, we know we've done wrong. Just like those people knew they had crucified Jesus and done wrong. And so they said, what can we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent. Repentance is, and like I said, Brother Cooley did a tremendous job, is that turning away from the lifestyle you used to live and the way you used to act and the things you used to do. You know, that's one thing I'll tell some of us Pentecostals. If we're still doing the worldly things we used to do, maybe we need to pray through again. If things that you cleaned out of your house when you prayed through the first time because you repented, if it's in your house now, maybe it's time to do an evaluation of your Holy Ghost because he's not changed. And if it was wrong when he convicted you of it back then, it's still wrong today. You need to repent again because you allow something to slip back in the door. Oh, well, I, I feel like I touched something there. Can I preach on it for just a minute? Huh? I mean, it's like my office. I clean my office or have somebody come. Sometimes some of these ladies are so nice, they come clean my office for me. And uh, I'm so grateful and thankful. And they sweep around that door. And, and you know, sometimes there's leaves and from that tree. And there's stuff that, you know, when the water washes some of the mulch out, and it'll all get in that doorway. And it's just a mess. And, you know... Uh, I, I clean it. I sweep it out, or and they sweep it out. We we mop it, and I mean it's good for a couple of days. And then I walk in, and the wind's blowing outside, and all of a sudden, something, something kind of just sneaks back in. Just kind of finds its way back into my my office. And a few days later, I'm looking. I was like, I thought I just cleaned this up. You see, that's how the enemy does. He doesn't just let things just walk in with you. He's just going to kind of slip them in, little by little. Oh, it ain't that bad. But back in the day, you were convicted over it. Back in the day, you said, I ain't going to let this thing in my house. I'm not going to listen to this kind of stuff anymore. But repentance is, you repent, it's time to, we got to repent afresh, repent afresh and say, 
I don't want to. I, because I, you know what? I know this that when I repented of something and I leave it behind me, man, I feel so much better in the Lord. I have so much more confidence in the Lord. Huh? Now I'm just I'm just getting down to brass tacks and teaching tonight. But think about it. When you've let something slip back in, that's neutralizing your Holy Ghost. Because the devil doesn't want you to backslide. He just wants you to be neutralized. And you're in Walmart, and somebody says, will you pray for me? And all of a sudden, as soon as you go to pray for them, the devil says, ah, you remember what you brought back in your house? You know, that doesn't neutralize your Holy Ghost. Go ahead and pray for him, but you know you ain't got no confidence in your relationship right now. Now, maybe I'm just the only one that's ever had that conversation with him. I'm not standing up here, you know, if I'm pointing one finger at you, I'm pointing three back at me. And I've had to repent again over some things that I thought, you know, Lord, forgive me. That thing just got got in the door and I want to get it out again. Because we're all human. And we all have human nature. And so it's constantly, we got to get it under the, fle- uh, under the blood and keep it under the blood and don't let it come back up. Because something that's dead comes back to life is what brethren any of the men that went to men's conference a zombie <laughs> and i tell you what that message brother Gurley preached fits the day and age of our of, that we're living in now but i don't want to be a spiritual zombie i don't want the things that i put to death to come back to life in my life that's part of the old testament it's died So I've got a witness that God can deliver, God can save, God can heal, God can do all these things. But we have to stay in a place where he can work in us. Amen, church? So we've got to repent. We've got to ask God to forgive us of the old things that we've done, the things we've done wrong, things that we're guilty of. Ask him to forgive us of those things. Put them up on the altar. And be baptized, every one of you, In the name of Jesus Christ for the remission. And we know that without the blood, the shedding of blood, there is no remission according to Hebrews 9 and 22. So he says, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So the blood is only applied when we are baptized baptized in Jesus name and when we are baptized in his name our sins are washed away because the blood is applied amen so when I was baptized in Jesus name I did more than just go down in the water and come up wet but the name of Jesus was applied and the blood of Jesus was applied to my life And he washed all my sins, all the things of the past. That Old Testament, amen, was purged by the name and the blood of Jesus. Amen, amen. Acts 22 and 16. So we know in Scripture that you will not find anywhere where they baptized in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You will not find it. It's not in the Word of God. In fact, if you can find anywhere where they baptized in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, here's the keys to my truck. I will give it to you. Now, you see, he's like, they're like, yeah, you, you know pretty well. You wouldn't even bring it up if you didn't know. Some of them are like, man, I'm getting my Bible tonight. I'm going to find that. I will show that preacher. I know somewhere in Matthew 28. I know it's in there somewhere. They baptized in Jesus' name. And in Acts 22 and 16, And now while tarriest, why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Calling. Calling means to invoke. On the name of the Lord, Jesus. In other words, he said, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away the sins calling on the name of Jesus. The ones that called or invoked 
on the name of Jesus are the ones that were doing the baptizing. So if your sins are to be washed away, you must be baptized in the name of Jesus because the blood is applied when you are baptized in his name. Amen. Now, I don't know why I'm teaching on this tonight. I just want the church to understand it's more than just getting baptized in Jesus' name. Amen. The blood of Jesus is being applied to your life, and the testimony that you had of the past is gone, and a new testament is started in your life. Amen. We know in Acts 8, 16, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. We know in Acts 10, 48, that they were baptized in the name of the Lord, or in the name of Jesus Christ. We know that in Acts 19, that uh, Paul was there, amen, and he was passing through the upper coast of Ephesus, and there he finds certain disciples. He knows they're believers. You know, and Brother Bybee and I were having a conversation in the office tonight, and he and I are in agreement on this, and I think it's a wonderful thing. But you know what? Sometimes we got to be careful how we treat other people of other faiths. Sometimes we want to circle the wagons and think that they don't have any kind of knowledge or relationship with the Lord. But if I can take what they do know and start building on that and build a relationship with that, we'll see the church grow. Because there are people who are hungry. The Bible tells us to shun the world, not the people of the world. Oh, Lord, I'm, I'm teaching and preaching tonight. And, but we, we, we've got to make ourselves available to them. They can't look at us and think, well, I don't want to go there. You're just a bunch of snooty Pentecostals. Think you're better than everybody else. Sister Alba's got my father's gene, you know. She sings that song, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I'm a goody two-shoes. Huh? We've got to be careful about that, about what kind of spirit. I want the Holy Ghost. You know, everywhere Jesus went, he, he went with peace and love and, and, and calmness. He was meet, looking for needs. Huh? That one song said, he came looking for me. You know, he came looking for you. Come on, he went to Zacchaeus and said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house today. I got all these people around me, but I'm going to your house. And so when we, if we're the body, and if we're the ones that are supposed to go out in the world, then we better make sure we take that attribute and spirit of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Brother Wet. Appreciate you agreeing with me on that. Because what they see... And we got to be careful. A lot of times we use the statement, well, what you see is what you get. Well, then if what they see is what you get, it better be Jesus. Because uh, they watch. They watch. If we're his hands and feet, it better be Jesus. My conversation better be right. It better be holy. It better be uplifting. It better be encouraging. So Paul, he sees these disciples. He, he noticed they were believers. He knew who they were. He said, hey, well, how have you been baptized? And these disciples had been baptized once before, but not in the name of Jesus. And they said, verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. So they had been baptized under John's baptism. I got ahead of myself. They got baptized under John's baptism. Amen. And there are those that baptize their babies when they're born. And they say in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. No name has been applied. And that baby is in a state of innocence. It has no reason to repent. So, 
Until there's repentance, there's no baptism. Peter said, the first thing you do is repent. Not get born and then just have your sins forgiven and by a priest. No, it's got to be done by the one who shed the blood. That's why we wear the name of Jesus. He's the one that shed the blood. That's why his name is applied. Because without his name being applied, his blood cannot be applied. But when I speak his name, his blood is applied to my life. Aren't you thankful that baptism is so much more than just going down in water and getting wet? Because the Bible says in verse 4 of Acts the 19th chapter, it says, And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Sister Brain. They wanted that remission of sins. They wanted the name and the blood applied to their life. When they heard the truth of God's word about Jesus Christ, they were rebaptized in Jesus' name. Amen. I am running out of time and I've got so much more to say. In the Old Testament, in order to be one of God's people, you had to be circumcised. Colossians 2 and 11, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, for lack of time, we know that in the book of Genesis with Abraham, God told him they needed to be circumcised. Sized and the foreskin of the flesh of the male was removed from his body by a so sharp object which caused blood to be shed. And in the New Testament, a person must spiritually be circumcised to be one of God's people. And the spiritual circumcision happens when we are baptized. Colossians 2 and 11 and 12, when ye came to Christ, he set you free from your evil desires not by a bodily operation of circumcision, but by a spiritual operation, the baptism of your souls. For in baptism, you see how your old, evil nature died with him that was buried with him, and then you came up out of death with him into a new life because you trusted the word of the mighty God who raised Christ from the dead. That's the Living Bible translation. And so, what happens? There was a circumcision of the heart. You obeyed the word of God. And at baptism, the old evil nature was buried with him in baptism. And you came up into a new life, a new testimony. You say, I've been changed. Colossians 2 and 13 lets us know. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses. Why? Because you were baptized. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us and took it out of the way nailing it to the cross. To his cross. And lastly, here's another reason why we have to be baptized in Jesus' name. We've got to have the proper wedding garment. Revelation 7 and 13, and one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of of the lamb the only way a person can wash their robe and make them white in the blood of the lamb is by being baptized in jesus name because the blood is only applied when you're baptized in jesus name can the church say amen i want that name applied to my life i want that blood apply i want my sins to be washed white as snow i want the old testament to be a thing of my past and the new testament to be a thing of my present and future because here's the thing 
Matthew 22 and 1, And Jesus answered and spake unto them by parable and said, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them which were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlands are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways, and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. This has not happened yet, but it will happen. The king is Jesus, and he spotted a man that did not have on the wedding garment. In those days, the grooms provided all the guests with the wedding garment. But this man chose not to put it on. And it's the same today when a person chooses not to be baptized in Jesus' name. They refuse to put on the proper wedding garment. You say, how do I know that is the proper wedding garment because Revelation says these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And he said, And friend, how comest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Jesus asked a question that he could not answer because he had no excuse. Because he had the chance to put it on, but refused. If we're going to put on that robe. We've got to be baptized in Jesus' name. And allow the blood of Jesus to be applied to our lives so that the old man can die, but the new man can live again. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called... But few are chosen. The ones that are chosen are the ones that obey the total word of God. Matthew 7 and 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. We've got to be so careful. I don't ever want to get to the place where he doesn't know my name. They did everything in Jesus' name except be baptized in his name. And that's why there was still iniquity there. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And then the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. If you're to build your house, do it on the total word of God. Be baptized in his name. And I know I'm preaching and teaching to the church tonight. But understand, there is so much importance in the name of Jesus. That's why the Bible lets us know we're not to take the name of the Lord in vain. I can put up with a lot of cursing. But if I hear somebody start taking the name of the Lord, I cringe. Somebody's, you know, said, God, this. You know what I'm talking about. And that word means eternally lost without no hope of salvation. So I've heard somebody say that before. God, I said, is that what you really want? You want them to be totally lost without any to no hope of eternal salvation? Because if he does it, that's what happens. Look at Sodom and Gomorrah.
I've told stories about guys when they would take Jesus and they'd say, Jesus Christ. And I say, well, praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's time for church. And they look at me like I'm crazy. I said, well, you said his name. I thought we was going to have church. That ain't how I meant. I said, exactly. So don't do it. Because <laughs> there's something about the name. What? A lovely name. The name of Jesus, reaching higher far than the brightest star. It's sweeter than the songs they sing in heaven. Let the world proclaim what a lovely name. I'm so thankful for the name tonight. Because of the name. And the shed blood of Jesus. I've got a testimony. I was condemned in my sins. Bound for hell. But because of his name. And the blood that was shed for the remission of sins. And me being me going down in a watery grave. Being baptized in Jesus name. I came out with a new testament. And I thank God for that tonight. Do you thank God for that tonight? Why don't we just stand to our feet and begin to give God thanks tonight that we're no longer what we used to be. I want to make sure that everybody knows what's going on and uh, very thankful for that. There will be no children's choir tonight. They will be in here. No youth tonight. They will be in here as well. Amen. Ladies, team two, deep cleaning this weekend. Everybody say praise the Lord. Those that are part of our regional CCB choir for the camp meeting will have practice this Friday night at 7 o'clock in the ward. If you want to go uh, ride with someone, uh, just let's get together, communicate, so we can all be down there for the practice. Amen? Youth garage sale and car wash, Saturday, August the 1st, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Amen. We're just trying to get some additional funds to cover any expenses that we have on our NAYC trip. Speaking of that trip, we are leaving Wednesday, August the 5th at 6 a.m. And if you're not here at 6 a.m., no, we won't leave you. But we're sure going to give you a mean look. Somebody say praise the Lord. Look at your neighbor and say it's okay to smile. You're supposed to have the Holy Ghost. <laughs> well, some of you still frowning at me, but that's okay. I love you anyhow. Amen. On a more serious note, um, last Thursday, Sister Heather's grandfather, many of you know, was in an automobile accident out on uh, the Bowling Highway and uh, rear-ended somebody. Uh, I don't know all the details of that, but we do know that he rear-ended somebody. And from all looks, there was no time for breaks. And uh, he was in the hospital this whole past week, and unfortunately, he developed pneumonia and passed away last night at 1025. So Sister Heather's going to need our prayers and her family. Uh, is going to need our prayers and support. And uh, we will be asking several of you to, to kindly help out with some food items for them. And then they've asked to have the, the service here. And several of you, most of us knew uh, Grandpa Delgado. And uh, I'll never forget my first encounter with him was over in New Orleans. And we'd been at the uh, hospital all night. And everybody was deciding where they were going to sleep. And they were like, well, where's Grandpa going to sleep? And because uh, all the rooms were pretty full, and I said, "Well, I got an extra bed," so Grandpa bunked with me that night, and uh, we we got to know each other. Found out that he's an old cowboy, and so we really hit it off and and talked about cowboying. But uh, 88 years old, and uh, we never understand everything that happens, but we have to just trust in the Lord and and just pray for peace for the family. Amen. And so she has asked for the service to be next Wednesday here at 2 o'clock and even asked that, you know, uh, we could help uh, with, with serving. And, and, and I, I feel like uh, because of all of those that are part of this family, next Wednesday night, I think I'm going to ask the church, instead of us uh, having service here, 
we're going to be in service. And what I mean by that is, I think it would be a great thing if we as a church would just surround Sister Heather and her family. Many, many of those have been members of our church. Uh, this is Sister Christine's father, Sister Sylvia's father, and Sister Delgado's husband. And I just want to surround them. And next Tuesday or next Wednesday at, uh, at 2 o'clock, we're going to have the funeral and uh, then serve afterwards. And, I, you know, Sister Heather, uh, she's not here, so I can say this, and, and she won't be thinking I'm trying to just build, but, you know, she works very hard for our church. She works very hard for our church. And she leads our ladies in the fundraiser. The, the bathroom remodel, she was in on every fundraiser. And sometimes even when she was expecting, she was in the middle of fundraising. And, and so I really want this church family to make sure she knows that we are here for her. Amen? So next Wednesday night, uh, because the funeral will be at 2 o'clock, then we're going to feed the family and take care of them. So if you can, many of you that can, uh, we're going we want to set up and serve them in the back. Amen. Then we'll have to clean up. By that time, it would be 5 or 6 o'clock. And I just feel like that w sometimes you got to put shoes on the what you believe. You can talk it all day long, but until the rubber meets the road. We can talk about loving somebody and being there for somebody. But I think as a church, the, the lesson for next week is service and compassion and comforting to a family that's going to be hurting. Amen. And I tell you what, we will make a greater witness in doing that. And so I'm encouraging you, please, ladies, you know, if, if we have to designate one lady to take care of our children, so the rest of the ladies, or two of them, to, to be at somebody's house. Amen. And then so others can be here to help. Don't make excuses. Now, you can look at me funny all you want, but I'm just telling it like it is. We make excuses for a lot of silly reasons. Because when we get to heaven, we sing, what a day that will be. But I promise you, you better have made sure everything's in order when you get there. Because we're in the dispensation of grace now. But when we get there, the door of grace, the dispensation of grace will be over. And we will stand before him not no longer as an advocate but as a king it's kind of like there was a young man that continually got in trouble and there was a lawyer a friend of the family that would continually go and, and plead his case and stand before the judge and was constantly getting this young man out of trouble but then one day the young man got in trouble and uh, you know he was wanting to to get out of trouble but the lawyer wasn't available and what he found out was is when he walked in the courtroom that lawyer who had so many times been his advocate with the judge was now the judge. And he told the young man, you know, before I was your advocate, but now I'm your judge. And that's Jesus, folks. Right now he's our advocate with the Father. Right now he stands before the, the throne and petitions the Father. Hey, have mercy, have grace. But there'll be a day when he will sit up on the throne as our judge. I don't want there to be anything in my life against anybody. Well, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, precious Savior. So can we do that next Wednesday? Next Tuesday night, the, the family will be coming for a, a viewing at 4 o'clock, I believe. And, and then that, that evening, they'll, they'll have a, a viewing for friends and family. I'm sure we're going to do, uh, uh, my wife will make sure I get it all straight, but some coffee and cookies and that kind of stuff for the viewing for the family. And then that day, let's just show up and show all the love we can is that okay i know many of you have to work and i understand that but if you can at all be that that's what we need to be doing next wednesday night praise the lord praise god thank you church i appreciate it uh sister bumgarner has i believe permission slips and medical releases for all the young people that are going to be going please let's get those filled out that way if i get to oklahoma and one of your children have any type of medical issue i can take them to the emergency room and then call you amen 
And uh, But uh, I don't feel like we'll have any problems, but we always want to be careful. And let me just say this. It's so good to have Sister Webb home tonight. Amen. Glad to see her back in the house of the Lord. Amen. God touching her life and healing her. Sister Teresa Cedillo had knee surgery on uh, Monday morning. And I, I was there with her at 6 o'clock. She called me at 4.20 in the morning to make sure that I got up. Pastor, you're going to be there at 6? I'm going to be there. You hold the fort while I get there. <laughs> oh, I love her. She's so fun. And, uh, but uh, she did very well. And uh, you know you've had plenty of surgeries when you take your own pillow to the hospital. Yeah. <laughs> when I went to check up on her, she was all propped up in the bed, had her own pillow, just making herself at home. And I'm glad to see that. And she was very upbeat and gave God all the praise. So yeah, anybody have any questions about her, that's what's going on. And, you know, we just got to be there for each other, folks. We need to be there for each other. I'm going to go to the book of Hebrews tonight, the ninth chapter. tell you I, i'm getting excited about our camp meeting i went down to victoria last yesterday evening and uh, worked with our musicians for the choir and you know there's some great young people in our section i mean there's some young people on fire for god wanting to do something for him and and uh, we practiced some of our songs but then we got into uh, just uh we i started pray playing the song lord you're holy and and uh, sister Courtney Tristan and her brother they began to sing and the other musicians they got into it and we began to have some worship right there in the middle of a of a, of a practice I think that's what it's all about just worshiping him so I'm looking forward to camp meeting I believe it's going to be something that we'll all get to enjoy Hebrews the ninth chapter the 16th verse it's a very familiar scripture and it says for where a testament is there must also of necessity be the death of the testator for a testament is of force after men are dead otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth and so I just want to teach tonight I've got a testimony. You've got a testimony. And I'm going to talk about the power of our testament tonight. Lord Jesus, I thank you tonight for being in this house. I pray, mighty God, that you would anoint these lips of clay, anoint every ear to hear, bring understanding to our mind. Help us, mighty God, to grow closer to you. And I give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated tonight. Now, a, a testament or will can only be a force after men or women are dead. And it was not until Jesus died and shed his blood that the New Testament got started. While he was still living, he was fulfilling the law while living under the law so something had to die for a new testament to start and, and jesus fulfilled that in his death he began the new testament and you and i tonight when we die out to ourselves when we repent say god forgive me of my sins and we repent. We are dying to this old flesh. And uh, we are telling it we no longer want you to have domination in our life. And so we are starting a new chapter. And we've got, we begin a testimony about the things that died and yet the things which now live. You used to be a whoremonger, but you're a whoremonger no more. 
You used to be a, you know, a drunkard, but you're a drunkard no more. You used to be a drug addict, but you're no longer a drug addict. Something died. And with that death in you, the old man, the Old Testament dies and the New Testament is created. So we're new creatures in Christ because of a death of the old and a life in the new. Now this may be just simple cornbread and beans tonight, but I promise you it'll help you to live. Now, the first testament was not dedicated without blood. Hebrews 9 and 18 says, Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. So, we know that the Old Testament is a type and shadow of things to come in the New Testament. And you can go through the tabernacle and each piece of furniture represents a type and a shadow of something being fulfilled in the New Testament within the church. Amen. The tabernacle of old, the temple of the old, amen, is a reflection of the temple of the new, which is you and I. So types and shadows. Exodus, the 12th chapter, the first verse. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month, shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house Take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side post and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw nor sodden it all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the purdents thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. For that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all of the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, oh, I remember this, this makes me want to sing. When I see the blood, anybody remember that one? I will pass, I will pass. Anyway, I'll get back to my message. It's a great song and from a great passage. I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite all the land. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Now that was a lengthy reading, but it is telling the story uh, of the beginning of the Passover. And so we know why we call it the Passover is because they took the blood of that lamb 
and they applied it to the side of the doorpost and overhead the doorpost and they took the lamb and they cooked it they cooked it and they they partook of it and whatever they did not eat they burned it up the next morning as as a sacrifice and as an offering and so and the meaning of it was that when that angel came the death angel came he would pass over the households that had the blood applied that's why we sang that song for many years and I think we ought to sing it again sometime when I see the blood when I see the blood when I see I will pass I will pass over you and you think about that today let me ask the question what would have happened at midnight if they had done everything that Moses instructed them to do except put the blood on the top and the side of the door they may have killed the lamb they could have roasted the meat they could have eaten it like he, they were told to do but they did not apply the blood what would have happened their firstborn would have died so doing just some of what God says won't save you you got to do everything God says to save you and you know that's you know we love the Bible but sometimes we don't like what it has to say because it tells you to change your habits and change your ways and he wants you to repent of things you're doing wrong and not go back to them like a dog to its vomit he doesn't want you to act like the old man he wants to make you a new creature in Christ he knows what you were before you found him he knows where he saved you from he wants you to become something different I mean you may have been a brawler but now he wants you to be a lover now my father he makes crazy songs up and I think I you know but when he was a young man he was a fighter he's got a broke nose that has been broke three times to prove it had his eye busted a couple of times it kind of groups down in this you know but you know growing up he'd always sing I'm a lover not a fighter I'm a kisser, not a biter. Catch you a little tune there, yeah. And some of us, we got to change our song. Because he changed me. He took out the anger and the bitterness and the, and the hate. He took out all that ugliness that was on the inside of me see that, that died that old man dies see when I repent that old man dies and and then I put the blood to my life and we're gonna get into that but I become a new creature I got a testimony what I used to be I no longer am amen I used to fight but now I just love everybody I got that old-time religion and it makes me love everybody amen like the old boy, you know, he, he got saved, you know, and he used to be a fighter. And everybody, every time he'd see somebody, he'd want to fight him, you know. And he got saved, and, man, the Lord changed him and made, made him love everybody. And he's walking down the street, and he sees one of the old boys he, he used to fight with. And he went over to, to give him a hug, and that guy reared back and said, Hey, now, you wait a second. And he says, I just want to give you a hug. Get me a hug? I thought you were ready to give me a slug. <laughs> But when God gets a hold of you, he changes you. He takes that potty mouth. We live in a different day. Back in the day, you know, it used to be men, you know. Watch your language around the ladies. So either we no longer have ladies... Well, I'm just telling it like it is. 
because we, you know, maybe we don't have gentlemen either, anymore e either. Anybody can be a man, but it, you, you can choose to be a gentleman. And I think if some of us men would act like gentlemen, more of our ladies would act like ladies. But, you know, in this day and age, I've seen some young ladies that if my grandmother heard them speak, they better run because of the Lysol or the soap. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Because back in them days, they didn't care, you know, they'd just wash your mouth out with soap. But in this day and age, you even threaten to do something like that and, and uh, you know, oh, you're going to jail. But we, we've changed, though. God changes us. He takes some Holy Ghost soap and he cleans our mouth out. Huh? And I know he's still working on all of us, but that's what happens. You know, he takes that mouth that used to just speak profanities, and now we begin to praise God. We begin to magnify God. We thank you, Jesus. And you can, you can do it. We choose what we say. Because I've seen a man hit his finger with a hammer, and instead of saying a curse word, he just said, Glory! I said, you say that long enough, Dad, you'll start speaking in tongues. <laughs> but we're a changed individual. But we have to have the blood applied. If they didn't apply the blood to the doorpost, the angel of death would have come in and their firstborn would have died. But because the blood was applied, the Passover became a remembrance. And they understood the significance of the blood. If it was good in the Old Testament, it's good in the New Testament. John, the first chapter, and the 29th verse says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away... The sin of the world. It is not enough that Jesus shed his blood. But his blood must be applied to the houses that we are. Just like in the Old Testament. Somebody say I need the blood applied to my life. Because our house is our body. 1 Corinthians 6 and 19. What? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You're the dwelling place of God's presence, so the blood must be applied to your body. It's not enough that Jesus came and died for the sins of this world, shed his blood on Calvary, but it must be applied to our lives. And I know most of you know this, but I just want to bring it home to you tonight. Is that all right? Praise God. Luke 24 and 47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now, Jesus is speaking to his disciples here, and he's telling them that they must preach repentance and remission what is remission forgiveness which cannot happen without the shedding of blood so the remission of sins comes with the shedding of blood in his name beginning at jerusalem and so again i, I want to repeat that a person cannot have remission or forgiveness of sins without blood being shed and applied. Hebrews 9 and 22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. So you cannot have forgiveness of sins, amen, without the blood of Jesus. you got to have it in your life. 
Amen. I don't want the angel of death to stop at my house. I want him to pass over me. Amen. Uh, when, when I stand before the Lord, I want the blood of Jesus to be applied in my life. Amen. So we know it's very important. Amen. I've got a testimony. I've been changed. Look at somebody say, I got a testimony. I've been changed. Now, Brother Cooley preached on repentance. And if you want to know about repentance, I, I encourage you, buy the CD. You know, find it. We got it on our webpage. Listen to the powerful word that he brought us on repentance. Because not only does it apply to the sinner who is seeking the Lord, but it applies to us as a church. You can't go back to the Old Testament after you started a New Testament. Because what happens is, is you, you, there, there's confusion. And there's a warring in the member, and so you're pulling one against the other. And so we have to be careful that carnality, and I'm not even going to get on that tonight, but that carnality that doesn't destroy the saint of God. Now, I like to pick on folks and, uh, you know, and, and scare them. Amen. Sister Louisa can testify to that. When she opened the door and I said, Holy Ghost check or something like that. She let out a scream. And she didn't cuss me though. She has a Holy Ghost. <laughs> That's a good check. You know, people start getting on you, you know, it'll test your Holy Ghost. But I love it when somebody comes through with flying colors, you know. Ah, you ain't got me. I got the Holy Ghost. You can talk about me all you want. I got the Holy Ghost. People say, what are you talking about? I, I got the Holy Ghost, but I got the Spirit of God living inside me. And when this old flesh tries to take over, I just go have me a little prayer meeting. You know, that's the New Testament. Now, the Old Testament, you say something alive and want to fight. Huh? Because we all go, you know, when the Old Testament's got a chip on its shoulder. Is that not true? That old man, he, he's looking for a fight. But the new man, you know, he's looking for a place with God. You have been changed. Have you been changed? Have you been changed? Do you have a testimony? Or does the old man rule in your life? Because he's going to test you. Your testimony will be tested. Because the old man dies and he's a testament of the things past. The new man lives and he's a testament of the present. But when we get to him... The life we live here will be the testament of our past. Are you understanding what I'm teaching tonight? The old man is our old testament. What we're living right now is our new testament. But when we get to heaven, this will be the testament that we look back on. And so it's important that the blood is applied to our lives daily. Paul said, I die daily. I repent daily. I make sure that I keep it where it's supposed to be. You know, uh, one thing that I can recall, and I know I'm talking about him a lot tonight. I guess I miss him. But, you know, one thing that my father does when he prays, and if he comes down here for any time at all, you will hear him say, I plead your blood, Lord Jesus. I plead your blood. And he takes that little old hand that's like that, and he, and he begins to put it over himself. And he just wants to plead the blood over himself and over his family. And he says, there's power in the blood, son. It, it washes sins. It keeps us protected. And amen, it, it gives me a clean heart. It washes me white as snow. Hallelujah. 
And so we go back to Hebrews 9.22, and without shedding of blood is no remission. And from there we could go to the book of Acts, and we love the book of Acts, and see how the disciples begin to uh, preach and teach, amen, baptism or, or remission. In Acts 2 and 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both 